So it is episode 41. And uh, as always, we start by saying thank you. And, and our guest, Ben Cormack, we're delighted he's joined us. It's, uh, he, it's, we, I'm surprised we've got him, actually, because he's so busy most of the time. <laughs> You'll have seen his work. You must have seen his work. Podcasts, Facebook Lives, seminars. I, I'm convinced I see your face more than my own, the face of my own wife. I'm certain of it. Um, <laughs> I, I might but we be. massively, we, mass- <laughs> <laughs> we, we do massively appreciate your time because we know how busy you are. You lecture literally around the world and, and that is no, that is no, not an exact, that's, that's not hyperbole. Um, you, you, I'm guessing your passport, you know, you've got more stamps than, uh, than Michael Palin. So, um, no, no, he's got a few more than I have. <laughs> but this, the, this, the, 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 the topic we thought we'd, we'd get you on to, to discuss around, and I don't know where it's going to go, and I'm kind of excited by that notion, is, is movement, rehab, exercise. Topics that if any, anyone who's familiar with you, with your work, with your, your postings, will know that these are areas that you're very comfortable um, talking about. And we'll try and um, you know, make them applicable to podiatry, but the, I don't think we'll have to try too hard to do that, because I think most of these concepts um are very podiatry applicable we just perhaps haven't you know woken up to that just yet so we've had a few things a few comments a few questions and topics come in to just sort of start off and, and you can take the conversation wherever you wish ben um we thought we'd start by um with a question that came in or in response to one of the things i th- i sort of flippantly wrote in the blurb when i announced your 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 episode which was that Ben's coming on to talk about exercise rehab and and there's a lot more to this than three sets of ten um, and it was a sort of throwaway comment from me but one uh, question did come in saying well where where does three sets of ten come from um, is there any value in it is it evidence-based does it belong in the bin or is it somewhere in between so we'll, we'll kick off there and we'll see we'll see where we go if that's okay yeah, I mean, I don't know if uh, there's a kind of, I can give you my opinion rather than an evidence-based answer. Um, and, you know, from from what I know, because actually originally my first entry into the world of kind of um, movement and exercise was I got a personal trainer qualif- for qualification back in the late 90s. No, it must have been, yeah, late to mid 90s, like about 97. And, um, you know, and that's kind of what we were taught then you know, that exercise was very much about three sets of 10. And then obviously I went away to university and stuff and my undergraduate didn't really do any exercise. Um, It was all, you know, electrotherapy and manual therapy and Maitland and all this other kind of stuff that we will, we learn. But I think certainly when I was learning about exercise and maybe this is where some of my passion about exercise comes from is that, you know, we were looking at just basic rep ranges um so if you think about rep ranges we might look at one to two for power we might look at you know two to five for strength you know lower rep lower reps higher load we might look at eight to twelve for hypertrophy we might look at over 15 for endurance so i think one of the things that really governs um exercise at the time in the 90s was kind of things like bodybuilding and gym machines and exercise machines and stuff and it was very much about getting big and you know maybe not strong but certainly big and you know everything was like pretty much three sets to ten it's about volume and we know that hypertrophy the more volume we have um the more fatigue you get generally the more you grow your muscles that's why bodybuilders do lots of kind of lots of volume of exercise you know and stuff um so I think it probably comes from just like being a little bit lazy in, in some respects, because if you actually think about um, clinically, that hypertrophy isn't actually something that you need that often clinically. You know, it might be that post ACL, you might want to, you know, get the quads bigger and stronger and the muscles around the knee. Um, it might be immobility. It might be cases of some nerve a- it damage or issues where we have atrophy lack of neural drive, etc. So really, um, I think three sets of 10 comes more from the world of exercise and fitness um, than it does actually from the world of therapy. But I think we've kind of, those two areas merge. When we look at exercise therapy, it probably takes a lot from exercise itself. But I think that merges us really nicely into what we know about exercise for rehab now, which is things like strength, hypertrophy, rep ranges, and all those kind of things don't really relate very well to some of the data that we have on pain. So we know that we can change strength, pain doesn't change. We know that we can don't change strength, pain can change. 
So it's kind of, we borrow things from the world of fitness, but they don't always relate to therapeutic exercise. And I think that's a really important place to, to understand exercise versus exercise for pain. Yeah, brilliant. So the, the sort of old school way of, of someone getting into rehab and sort of giving, you know, the isometrics, the eccentrics, the three sets of 10, the, re the recipe book approach, um, completely, yeah. inappro completely inappropriate in 2018? You know, I think we have to look at a number of options. So is exercising and loading for recipe basis more beneficial than not loading at all? And so you'd have to say yes. You know, as we move away from needling people and, you know, the most time that I actually spent at university was doing frictions and electrotherapy, as I remember. Um, so, you know, even doing a recipe book approach to exercise is better than not doing any kind of exercise or loading at all. But certainly, I think if you're an evidence-based clinician and you're interested in doing the best job, um, you know, that certainly we have to understand, even when it comes to tendinopathy and loading, you know, I know that podiatrists are going to come across a lot of Achilles tendon issues, etc. You know, we know that going at isometrics as a rule of thumb to start is probably not really um, a, a kind. I call it cognitive efficiency, which is really laziness. You know, it's like <laughs> it, it, there's no reason that that we need to actually take these recipe approaches. If we look at some of the work into tendons, so much of it is actually theoretical. When we, you know, all these progressions and protocols and do this and then move to this, there's hardly any good RCT data of these rehab programs um, what we do see when we look at the data certainly is that when we compare loading programs let's say for tendinopathy and this was Pete, Pete Maliaris work with Hack and Alfredson I think where they did a, a review of the different loading programs they just didn't see that a massive amount of difference um, so I think what we can take from that is probably twofold that loading to some degree is probably individual we respond to it in individual ways um, but following some kind of protocol probably isn't evidence-based either. You know, I think you could justify lots of different loading protocols for lots of different circumstances. Yeah. Hey, just a comment yeah, you made. Perfect. A question. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you, Craig, go on. No, no. It's just that comment you made there being about the, a lot of the understanding of the, the tendinopathy approaches being theoretical. I mean, it may be quite sound theoretical uh, and understanding, but, a lot of that gets extrapolated to the plantar fascia as well, which is not a tendon. <laughs> so, you, right. sort of, you know, that's the theoretically of a theoretical, yeah, which sort of kind of makes yeah, it. Yeah, that, yeah, there has been, so I know that there's been, so I, I'm no expert here in specifically in the, in the tendon or the fascia, the plantar fascia, but certainly I know that it's been discussed that they are similar. I don't know whether that has very much data to support it. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> oh, did, oh, are you done, Craig? Can I can I ask a question that uh, Dave has just sent in because it's sort of relevant to this. Um, say say someone's just come out of podiatry school, not had a huge amount of exposure to rehab, as we don't get at undergraduate in in, in podiatry school. Um, where do they, where do we start? Where do they start? What's your recommendations? So I think learning more about this is, I suppose this is where we, this is where we come into a bit of a, a buffer because, you know, learning, uh, it would be nice to say learning more about exercise would be a nice place to start, but we can't take all the laws from exercise and directly put them into therapeutic exercise. But I would say that just a basic understanding of exercise would probably be a really good place to start. And I'm sure there's lots of exercise books out there that might give us um, just some, you know, how to learn basic exercises, maybe some basic rep ranges, how to maybe teach exercises from a safe perspective uh, might be a good place to start. But um, I don't know if there's a really, really simple route in here. You know, I think if you're going to get into it, then you, you have to start somewhere. But I think we also have to look at it from its own perspective as well um, it's like anything isn't it we can scratch the surface 
and we can look at it from a simple perspective, which might say exercise is exercise, let's start there. But if we actually scrape under the surface and say exercise for pain and pathology, then it probably becomes a little bit more complicated. Hence why you go to school for three years and then do a postgrad and then do a PhD and then you still don't know very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris, uh, Chris Bishop, hi Bish, if you're watch, still watching, uh, just made a comment and I'll, I actually had a question and I'll piggyback it off of Chris's comment and he referred to sort of dedicated strength training work, things like for Soleus, um, in runners versus just getting them to run for a sort of increased tissue capacity. And just off the back of that, um, I wanted to talk to, in general about the data that we have for, for strength work in runners, because I think one of the, I'm sure we've all come across it. One of the real big things out there is just, just get your runners strong and they'll be more robust and they'll be, and they'll be okay. Um, and, uh, I think I'm right in saying certainly in my, my delve into the literature that there's, there's, there's really good evidence to, sh to say that when we've got people in pain and we get them stronger, that sometimes certain types of pain can improve. But prospectively, we really don't have much other than a study that didn't even look at runners. Uh, you, is that a reasonable summation of the literature? So I think Seth has done some work looking at Soleus weakness with runners, as I recall, or maybe Soleus weakness with Achilles tendinopathy. And there have been some other work done. I think there was some work done by a friend of mine at Ghent, a guy called Damien Van Tigelen, um, who's done some good work into patellofemoral pain and, and, and Achilles pain and stuff like that. Um, I think the best thing to actually start with is not strength and pain, but differentiating strength and load tolerance, because they're not one and the same thing. And I think we often use one as a proxy for another. So I think running how much is running about strength versus low tolerance? Does, does that make some sense? They're, they're not, mm. it's low tolerance is very, very difficult to measure. I don't know how to measure low tolerance. You know, you might say, well, someone can't tolerate doing something, um, but, that, but we know pain is more complex than that. So certainly I think the first mistake that's made is, is saying, well, they're weak. They're obviously not low tolerant. Now, we know that there are marathon runners out there who are skinny as put in whatever word you want there and um they're they're not they're not as strong as power lifters and they're not as strong as bodybuilders and they're not as strong as um some other people but they have a, a huge amount of load tolerance so i think there's a there's a difference there straight away between using strength as a proxy for load tolerance another thing is strength is not strength strength is also very very specific just because you are strong in one way doesn't mean you're strong in another way so again measuring strength as a proxy in terms of for lifting a heavy load might be different to doing it in a, in a more specific action, et cetera. So strength is often specific to what you are doing. So I think that these are issues that we make. It's a very generic catch-all term. You are strong. Well, what does that mean? What does strength mean for a start? I'm strong at what? How are you measuring it? Isokinetically, are you measuring it in one action versus another action? How much strength does running require? You know, these are all questions that we have to ask. So I think there's a difference in understanding that probably strength and load tolerance are specific. Hence why if I was to go out and play football tomorrow for, for 90 minutes and I don't usually do it, I'm going to be in absolute pieces because I'm not load tolerant for football. But if I go out for an eight mile run, I might be load tolerant for that. So load <laughs> tolerance, again, is not generic strength is not generic and sometimes we look at them in very very generic ways but that was a really long-winded way of answering your question when it actually comes to strength and pain we don't see a great association certainly we you know we don't see it's a bit like when we look at tendon structure we don't see a good correlation between tendon structure and pain and we don't see a good relationship between strength and pain probably because pain is multifactorial so if pain is multifactorial, why would we see any singular factor giving us one simple, you know, guidance to, to why we have this problem? So essentially, if we see pain as a simple linear, then it might make sense. It, 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 it might make sense that strength was a big factor with pain. If you view it as multidimensional and multifactorial, then it makes complete sense that it doesn't have this linear isomorphic relationship. So, um, it's a really, really uh, crap, long-winded way to answer your question. Um, but 
you know, I think we, we sometimes misinterpret um, these simple relationships and, and, and they're, they're, they sound like simple questions. But how many different ways are there to measure strength, for example? Yeah, you know, I could measure it isotonically, I can measure it isokinetically. That is going to influence our, our, how that relates. Sure. Yeah. Now, off the, off the back of that, Ben, I recently Googled uh, just to see what was out there on uh, the treatment for posterior tibial tendinopathy. Now, so I looked at a whole lot of lay websites, a whole lot of clinic websites. Pretty yeah. much all of them recommended strength training for posterior yeah. tibial tendinopathy. And then I started to scratch my head. You've got a tendon here that's got a disease in it and you've got a muscle here. How would making that muscle there stronger affect a disease in that tendon there. And I, but I think what struck me the most was just how universally recommended that was. And what I started to wonder is the, is the absolute strength of that mus muscle an issue or is the process of strengthening it somehow rehabbing the tendon? So it's not the absolute strength. It's the, it's the actual, yeah, it's just, I just found it curious. That it was such so widely recommended. Well, I think you've touched on there, Craig, is the idea of strength versus load tolerance, yeah. because the process would be the, 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 the exposure to the load. Yep, exactly. So <laughs> rather than, yes, yeah, so, so you've just highlighted exactly what I'm, what I'm trying to say yeah. in a much more succinct manner. I, didn't, I went all around the houses. You just gave me a simple explanation. <laughs> you did a much better job than me. But certainly, you've highlighted the fact there that we're talking about the strength, but actually, Actually, it may be the actual exposure to load. We just don't know. That, that's the point. We don't have good data. And what Ian brought up there was the, um, the oh, I've forgotten the name, the Larson paper from BJSM, where they looked at strength training being um, protective or, um, or for, for injury. Uh, uh, you know, and they're saying that strength training is protective for musculoskeletal injury, overuse injury, etc. But this is a great example of where you, and I know Craig would do this because he, you know, he's, he's a critical guy. You, you, if you actually go back into, um, if you go and look at the papers that they looked at, 50% of the papers are hamstring papers. So they're based on eccentrics for and Nordics for hamstring strain. Um, so firstly, is a hamstring strain an overuse injury? Uh, no. Um, is a hamstring, it, it is, is strength training good for hamstring strains? No, that's why you have a specific eccentric program because it's not just strength training, it's eccentric load. It's quite a specific rehab. You know, just doing hamstring curls is not the same as doing an eccentric Nordic. They're, they're very, very different. They're, they're, you know, one would be much less specific. We also know that in that paper, there was no upper limb stuff, but it said strength training reduces all, all overuse injuries or, or all sports injuries. There wasn't a single upper limb paper in the whole um, meta-analysis. So I just don't know how they made these conclusions from that paper. But it's biased because people who want to believe it will come on board and say, oh my God, strength training, you know, is the second coming of Christ. And I just don't see that data. <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's not good and it's not good training. It just doesn't mean it's the second coming of Christ. Yeah, uh, but, but perhaps another way, of, <laughs> another way of looking at it, though, is that when you, if you're if going to do a study to look at it, you could look at, say, absolute strength versus not so strong, the injury risks there. But then another way to look at it, you could look at those who are undergoing a strength training program versus those that are not. And they may be at a less of an injury risk because they're participating in a loading program. Where they, yeah, so I think... But they may not have the same strength. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So, again, it... it it's an exposure based thing. Yeah. So I think if you look at most of the, uh, of these studies, they don't measure strength at any point. They measure participation in a training program. So we don't actually know if being stronger actually is protective of injury, but we know potentially that being involved in strength training can have an effect. But what, why is that? We have to ask ourselves, is it because you do less overload of another format? You know, does it mean that we actually load our bodies in more varied ways? It might could be, it could be another exposure could also have a protective effect. We just don't know. I just think there's a lot of questions there. Well, actually, it could be a totally spurious relationship. And because they're doing the strength training, they're not going for another run. Yeah, exactly. That, yeah, exact, that's the point. So yeah. because you're doing one activity, you're not doing another activity. So actually, 
it's load management, but just using another the load that maybe isn't having the same deleterious effect on the body it's just you know it's just another way of reasoning it yeah because i know i know my coach years and years ago when i used to run competitively said don't do strength training you know don't lift weights don't do any of that just go for another run you know <laughs> yeah, how did you get on craig well look at me now <laughs> <laughs> well craig for me that is better than any meta-analysis <laughs> Yeah, strong, <laughs> strong evidence. Um, science, science just coming back, just coming back to the Larson uh, trial that was in BJSM very briefly, because I was guilty of this when it first came out. Sort of looking at it and, and sort of quite like quite liking the quite liking the conclusion, which was that if we get these people stronger, I think it promised a a fifty percent a forty or fifty percent reduction in overuse injury, and I, and I see. Oh, I see overuse injury all day, every day. I like that. I like those numbers. And um, it was only really after I'd written a blog about it and put, you know, and, and done all those sorts of things that I, I thought, you know, I should dig into this a bit more. And then when I looked and, you know, I extrapolated this to runners and I, and, yeah, I looked at the, all the papers in there. It was soccer, handball, basketball with, with a three. Yeah, there, there was no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, Wow, I've extrapolated this to all runners. I've made a made a real error here, and I don't think I was the only one guilty of that. In no, terms, no, I so, think uh, we're all we've all there's thing we've all got our biases, and we all look at things more deeply when we don't like them. Let's be honest. I do it. You. Do it, <laughs> yeah. We all do yeah. it. Come on, if it gets if we I like it, it's like fine. That's no problems. If I don't, it's like <laughs> <laughs> we have to have a bit yeah. of honesty, right? We do. We do. If, if nothing else. Um, I want to touch quickly, if we can, Ben, on on a on a comment that you made on your on your Facebook in the last hour, two hours or so, which 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 sort of got me thinking. I was on the train home from London and I saw it, and I, and I thought, yeah, we're going to have to talk about that tonight. And I'm paraphrasing, um, but it was something along the lines of that your belief that the key component to success in rehab is is the engagement and participation of the actual athlete or patient and when we get failures and we all do uh, we're, we're very quick to blame the exercise that we've prescribed perhaps it was the wrong one perhaps it was the wrong rep range but actually um perhaps it was our inability to appropriately fit it or, or apply it to the person and then we're getting into the uh the worlds of sort of motivation empowerment could you if you don't mind sort of extrapolate on your thoughts on that one yeah, of course. I mean, I think exercise at its very least is dose dependent. You have to do it to get any kind of effect on from it. And so any exercise study simply suffers from external validity problems because we know the number one thing that, that exercise um, struggles with is adherence. You have to do it to get at some aspect of effect. So if we haven't engaged someone if we haven't motivated someone, then that they may not engage with the exercise that we've given them and they may not do it. So at the very least, there has to be the doing of the exercise. So it doesn't matter about the rep range or the weights or whatever, because all that is completely academic Isn't if someone doesn't do it. And what, one of the people that we can really learn from as therapists, aren't strength and conditioning coaches they they are people who deal with things like fat loss as far as i'm concerned because they have to deal with being able to motivate people understand people um you know often when you deal with things like sports injury sometimes there is an aspect of motivation anyway um with people but other times there isn't always the same level of motivation and i think therapeutic exercise can be really really boring let's be let's be honest about this doing uh, an Alfredson protocol, eccentrics, is not the most exciting thing that I'm going to do today. I absolutely promise you that. Um, and we know that the volume of that, you know, is going to be pretty long as well, isn't it? We know there's also a modified program, has the same effects, but, you know, by the by. So I think that we have to understand that if, if people aren't engaged and motivated with the exercises we're giving them, you know, then they are not going to do them in the same way that they would do maybe if they were motivated. So it has to come back to, you know, the point is that we, are, we will often worry about the, 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 the minutiae rather than understanding people's previous participation with exercise. 
you know, we know that if you haven't previously participated with exercise very well, that's likely to mean a failure in the future. If you've had failed rehab in the past, that might be another problem, you know, so motivation, predicted expectation, engagement, all these things are really, really good predictors of outcome. You know, most of the data we have with exercise and outcome is actually from things like back pain because there's the most funding, et cetera. Um, but certainly the very, very least we have to do with exercise isn't, you know, think about which is the best exercise. It's sometimes about who is exercising, you know, because I don't know what your adherence rates are like, but if you're average like me, then it's probably something about 50%. And, and you know Lower. what you're doing. <laughs> you know. yeah. So, off the back of that, and we're getting into a topic now that um, Craig and I are really into at the moment, and we're, 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 we're conscious that we're a bit behind the times when it comes to uh, these things compared to the other therapists, but we're, we're trying to get there. We've had Mike Stewart on, we've had you know Jared Hall on, um, both friends and colleagues of yours, I know. Yes. I just want to give you a little glimpse into what if you were put into a podiatry if you came and sat in with me tomorrow morning in canary wharf in my podiatry clinic the kind of thing you'd experience when my first patient walked in and then get your slant on 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 these things as well so quite often well almost 100 percent of the time people present to us in pain so there'll be some degree of of, of sensitivity antalgia um protectiveness Often kinesophobia, catastrophization, yep. all those words I know you love and no. that I've probably learned from you. Um, <laughs> they very often in the UK certainly will have seen what at least one, if not multiple clinicians before they've ended up seeing us. With negative. And as such, they'll bring, well, this is it. We assume so. Well, they, yeah, certainly they'll present to us with, with beliefs, expectations, the, the whole shebang. Um, we have definitely been guilty over the years, regardless of our intervention in the, in the context of this topic, exercise, rehab, but, but could easily be talking about orthoses. We've been very guilty of saying we are podiatrists, we, we fix feet. Here's a foot, here's a problem. We know it mechanically inside out. We, we look at it, we know what the problem is, we're going we're gonna to fix it. And, and we've been super guilty of ignoring the person and that entire scenario that I've just mentioned that's a, that the foot is on the end of that is attached to. Um, could you just talk through your, your, your thought processes if you were in, in our shoes tomorrow morning and, and someone came in sort of, how do you approach some of these topics? How do you, how do you communicate? How do you, how do you get people on board? How do you empower people? How do you motivate well, people? Yeah, totally. I think the first thing that you have to do is, is, is you, you don't just motivate people. You don't just empower people. You firstly, you need to listen to people. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to know about what they're scared of. I would like to know what's previously happened. I want to know their experiences with healthcare. I want to know what they've previously done in terms of exercise and loading. I would like to know um, what they've stopped doing because of their problem. You know, what we have to remember is, as you say, that people are more than just a foot. There's a whole person attached to it. But even beyond the person, it's a person with experiences that affects their behaviours. So a great example, if someone has, and we know that I think there's some good work actually come out now into the, into the foot and ankle and tendinopathies and some of the psychosocial factors, I think. Is it Sean McAuliffe? has done some stuff and there was another one on plantar heel pain and kinesophobia as I remember reading. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you know, firstly we never, I don't ever look at a foot or look at a back or look at I, the first thing that I would like to do is get that person. And I would like to know what the problem is, but then I would like to know how that problem has affected them and their lives because people don't, we know this people don't actually come to see therapists because they're in pain. They come to see therapists because pain is disrupted part of their life. People could live with pain if they can do everything that they want. Mostly. We know that from research into other areas that pain intensity is not the number one determinant of, of care seeking. It's actually high levels of disability. So pain affects us and it affects how we think and it affects how we feel and it affects what we do. And those factors, they make us low, they, 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 you know, reduce our circle of friends. They change our social lives. You know, what about if my plants are heel pain 
stops me now from going to play tennis and that's my only social contact in the week. And I get to go and see my friends and have, and that's a big deal. It isn't the pain in the foot that's the problem. It's the fact that I don't see my friends. I can't do the sport that I want to do. Now I'm putting on weight. I've got body image issues. Do you see what I mean? It's not, it's not this pain in the foot. Mm. It, pain is a bigger thing. And it affects us from the aspects of fear. Am I going to make this worse? And actually, you're not dealing with their pain. You might be dealing with their fear of what's going to happen if this pain continues. Is this going to cause me real damage? Um, so I want to get to know that person to some degree. Um, you know, I would say I work with things like motivational interviewing, um, looking at, you know, it, it, there was a great paper by uh, Marvel, 1999, that looked at a patient in 22 seconds. You know, and one of the biggest factors and moans that people have about healthcare is that they don't feel that they were listened to and they couldn't get what they wanted to get across. And it leaves them feeling frustrated. It leaves them feeling angry. And I want to be able to engage with that person. I want to be able to listen to them. I want to be able to understand how pain has disrupted their life. I'd like to understand more about their beliefs and their fears. And I'd like to know what this has meant for them as a person. And this sounds like it would take a long time. But it doesn't. It, it's simply a, a few well-placed questions. It might be, if you didn't have foot pain, what would you go and do tomorrow that you're not doing at the moment? You know, and I might then, they might say, well, I'd really love to go and do X. So I'd say, well, why don't we base our rehab around X? That's what we're going to do. And that simply is motivation. You know, it doesn't have to be this amazing, you know, brain surgery where I'm pulling things out of their psyche. You know, it might just be, what do you want to do? Let's base rehab around that. Let's make some goals. Let's make a short-term, medium-term, long-term goal. And let's, you know, actually do this around you rather than do it around your foot. Yeah, nice. Um, it would be a miss for me not to mention self-efficacy. Again, another term I <laughs> was, was not familiar with until I followed the likes of you and Jared and Greg yeah. uh, and, and the, the usual suspects. Um, my understanding of it is it's, it's our own belief in, in our ability to achieve those goals. So without it, we're, we're going to struggle and it's clearly going to influence um, human behavior. So what are the things we can do to facilitate that in our rehab, in our, in our management of, of foot pain for example what are the things that we may do inadvertently that prohibit it yeah so self-efficacy just really means do i feel like i've got the ability to perform this so in context that would be ian's given me a load of foot exercises to go away and do you know do i feel like i can do those things or ian's given me a graded exposure to sport do i feel like i can go away and do that am i in a place to do that so there was a, it was, it's, it's worked by a guy called Bandura uh, back in the 70s. And, and there's a number of factors that mean that our self-efficacy is reduced. But self-efficacy is one of the best prognostic factors for recovery um, that, that we have. If people have a sense of they can achieve it, they can get out of there and do this stuff that you set them, they are more likely to get better. You know, we have a number of these. Predicted expectation, do I believe that I am going to get better? That's one of the key factors. And do I feel like I can do the things required to get me better? That would be one of the other things. So there are a number of factors that go into self-efficacy. Firstly, would be my previous success. So have I been successful in the past? So a great example is, do you ask about someone's exercise history? So if you want someone to go out and exercise, would you like to know how their exercise history has been? Is this something that they've failed at in the past? Is it something they have a negative relationship with? You know, if I am well overweight, we, which we know can be uh, a comorbidity for foot problems and for lower limb problems, which is being obese. Um, if I'm overweight, could it be that I've already tried to exercise, to lose weight and been unsuccessful? Is that going to affect me and my perception of the exercises that Ian gives me to do? So how can we make that clinically applicable? Well, simply, I need to ask about that in my subjective history. If I want to use exercise, as a tool for rehabilitation then I need to know what has your relationship been with exercise are you a regular exerciser again adherence is affected by lack of regular um, regular exercise exercise adherence 
Um, so I would like to know, have you failed in the past? Have you failed with rehab exercise in the past? What do you feel like your relationship with exercise is at the moment? And if those things are low, how might that affect my exercise prescription? Well, it might be the amount of time and the number of exercise I give you is lower, that I'm not going to give you an eight hour exercise program. But then it also might affect it in the fact that I might actually get in there and start to talk about the relevance of the exercise, ways that you might be more successful. How can I support you to make this more, um, more applicable for you rather than something that you don't feel like you can do? So I think half of it is in the actual exercise description and the other half is in actually dealing with the concept of exercise and managing and planning. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I can't shake the feeling when we talk to you about exercise, rehab, movement, that you know we can learn as much as we want about how tissues respond at a cellular level to load and you know what, what strength training is and what endurance training is. But... There's more, there's more, the effects of exercise aren't just tissue specific. There's, we're clearly, you know, they're person, you know, we're treating a person here and it goes far beyond just the changes that they're getting in their tissues. This is, this is you know, we get, we're not psychologists by any means, but we're very much sort of um, sometimes feel like we, we're, we're treading into those waters. Is that, um, is that reasonable? I think if you think about being a human being interacting with another human being, you cannot divorce that from psychology whether you are flirting with the pretty blonde at the bar, that is psychology. If you are selling a car, that is psychology. If you are dealing with another person in pain, who is, you know, some people are more um, affected by pain than others. Some are very robust and, and it might not be an issue. But if you're dealing with someone who's been affected psychologically by the pain that is affecting them, then you are dealing with psychology. So it's about not, you don't diagnose psychological problems. We don't diagnose and treat psychological problems, but we recognize human interaction is psychological and key psychological measures are prognostic of recovery. Things like self-efficacy, et cetera, having an internal or an external locus of control. Um, so I, I don't, you know, we should, it's not about being a psychologist. It's actually about being a caring human being working with another person who's having a stressful circumstance. Um, certainly one of the reasons that we know exercise goes beyond all these tissue factors is because we ultrasound the tendon and it looks the same, but the person hasn't got the pain. Or we measure your strength and you're dramatically stronger, but you've still got pain. Or we measure your strength and nothing changes, but you haven't got pain. So the actual biomechanical data, or if you want to call it that, leads us to believe that we can't simply look at from a mechanical perspective. We have to move beyond that and say there are some of these other factors um, going on. But even really simply, so here's an example. Could it be that you're dealing with a very stressed out? You, you work in the city, right, Ian? You work at um, Canary Wolf. You yeah. must see some stressed out people every now and again. <laughs> every day. It's a, stressed, <laughs> it's a stressed environment, right? Could it be that regular exercise gives someone the ability to de-stress and it gives them the ability to get out of the office and it gives them the ability to not have to answer emails for an hour and the exercise actually has had an effect on their stress which might have had an effect on their pain? You know, it could be many ways. and Could it just be blood flow? Could it be endorphins? Could it be endogenous opioids, NMDA, GABA, you know, serotonin, all these other fancy chemicals? We just don't know but it has to be something beyond just these physical measures because we're measuring them and they are not giving us the answers that we want. So we can continue to get microscopic and talk about mechanotransduction and autocrine and paracrine signaling, calcium and fibroblasts and whatever else you want. Or we can actually say there could be lots of things that we are affecting beyond that physical structure, but that makes sense. Because we know that human beings are not just physical entities. You know, we know that pain is an emergent property, which simply means it's more than the sum of its parts. We can't explain it. You know, we can't explain it simply by neurotransmitters or, 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 or structure or even brain areas. You know, it, it's more than that. We don't understand it quite yet. But it, it, it doesn't make sense to me not to look at the, the kind of massive amount of psychological measures we do have that 
that tell us that these are some of the factors why people get better not some of these physical factors so one of the problems we have is people say oh my god now it's all psychological oh my god you've just thrown the baby out with the bathwater." if i had a pound for every time i heard that i'd have filled the bath with pound coins but <laughs> it's not about that it's about recognizing these things interact within a complex system you know the, the psychosocial factors are here to add to what we know about the biological they're not here to replace it but sometimes people feel uncomfortable getting into these things it goes outside of their training it goes outside of their belief structures and that becomes a problem you know it's not about replacing one paradigm with another it's about having a bigger better paradigm yeah let's um let's jump into something i wanted to talk about um it's topical it's timing wise and it's a recent paper very recent two days ago published on uh, isometrics for uh, plantar fasciopathy and the reason i th just suddenly came to mind is that when you refer to uh, you know people's belief structures um and i think you've got a lovely turn of phrase for this which i can't remember off the top of my head now where you know the treatment someone does is what they become but ultimately is their identity um, yeah that's that's the way yeah so we we sometimes find it difficult i'm sure you, you you know you agree to to separate what we do from who we are because we we invest time and like you say we're the experts but i know that you you myself craig we all are aware of this paper we all posted on our various social media channels and got some interesting responses i mean certainly my responses i don't know about yours but my responses to that paper both public and private messages were were sort of two very distinct clusters the people that said yeah, that makes sense. I'm aware of Seth O'Neill's work on isometrics not showing a massive pain reduction. I'm aware that the first, you know, a couple of the other papers maybe were slightly flawed. I don't get great results myself with isometrics, for example. That I like, I like the conclusion of that paper. And the other cluster was the people that, that immediately, perhaps without even reading the paper, sort of um, got defensive. They didn't like the methodology, which, which again, no, no methodology is perfect. Um, can we talk a bit about, I guess, well, firstly, I'd love your take on, on isometrics for, for plantar fasciopathy, tendinopathy, yeah, sort of generally. But secondly, how, how, we, how we divorce who we are from what we do. Yeah, so, I mean, first, I think one of the issues is, is that if you look at any exercise study um, and you look at the standard deviation and you look at the confidence intervals, you generally see they're pretty wide. And what that tells us is exercise has a very, very variable effect on people. Um, it can have um, no effect. It can be the best thing ever. It can make people worse. You know, we know that. Um, and there's been some studies that look at individual responders rather than group means, because we know when we take a whole bunch of people, stick them in a study, they spits out a number, compares it against another number, and that gives us this comparison. Does it work or does it not? You know, with this arbitrary p-value. But some of the that's one of the reasons I like Seth's study so much, because he looked at individual responders. And if you actually look at the group mean, it didn't represent anyone in the study. Um, the other thing is we saw that half of the people it made worse, half of the people it made better, you know. And also it showed that if you have higher baseline pain, plant uh, um, isometric exercise may actually make you worse. Um, that's what his study showed, although we know it was like only nine people. Um, but we know that other work with fibromyalgia sufferers shows that isometrics also often make them worse rather than make them better. So the takeaways we have is all exercise gives us individual responses. You know, there is no exercise that's just amazing for everyone because we all have our own individual um, pain killing mechanisms, etc. So exercise has the potential to make your patient better. It has the potential to make your patient worse. Um, what we might say is if we look at, say, a confidence interval, and it's got a gr much greater positive effect than it has a negative effect, we might say it's more likely to make our patient better. You know, But it, we can still have a negative effect. So it's important that no exercise is this golden bullet. We just fire it, and our patient just thinks that this is the best thing ever. You know, is that likely to happen sometimes? Of course. Is the opposite likely to happen? So anyone who thinks an exercise is just going to just work doesn't understand exercise and doesn't understand research. So for that's the, isometric research gave me exactly what every other exercise research has ever given us, that you get a variable response from exercise. 
Um, you know, and so I think that brings us to the next point, uh, which is identity. You know, if I've been there, ex you know, saying isometrics are the best thing ever, like the third coming of Christ after strength training, um, then, you know, <laughs> I've, I've, been there, I've been there and it's very hard to walk that back, isn't it? It's very hard to now say, well, actually, this isn't, you know, the best thing ever. Oops, I got it wrong. Um, and I think some people struggle with that. And I also think people have an identity, especially around exercise, but also around treatment in general. So, you know, whether you're Maitland or Mulligan or McKenzie, all these different things, that's always been an identity. But I think what we have now is we have strength guys and we have movement guys. Um, we have yoga guys and we have Pilates guys. So we're seeing this same identity with exercise. All exercise is positive. All right. All exercise for me is a positive thing. It doesn't always mean it's going to be positive for my patient. It doesn't always mean it's going to have the best effect. So I don't believe there's such a bad thing as exercise, but I do think we can use exercise inappropriately because we use it at the wrong time in the wrong way, if that makes some sense. But certainly treatment identity has been going back as long as there's been treatment, you know, whether you're Syriacs or, you know, which going, going back into the 70s and 80s with musculoskeletal stuff. So it's very much about identity. But for me, um, really, and again, this is probably why I'm not big on, you know, being the, the strength guy or whatever, is because I just don't see the evidence for it. So if I don't see the evidence for it, it's not going to be something that I particularly think is the next best thing or the biggest thing. You know, if we're evidence related, that should be our identity, you know, rather than being kind of some other identity, whatever that may be. You must have it in, in podiatry, right? kind of different people who do different things and <clears throat> we do yeah. we do uh, um and, and and i think the, the interesting point you make about sort of when we mean when we mean pool data and we get a, a mean coming out that well, we get that in orthoses research all yeah. the time yeah yeah um you, you you've touched on dosing a, a little bit earlier yeah. And we just touched on how individuals respond individually to shock horror. Catherine um, popped in with a question, which I think is pretty, pretty decent and pretty pertinent. And that is, do you think that, that we, that health professionals prescribing exercise, are guilty of underdosing? I don't really know. Because, you know, this is always, this is a discussion I've had on, on a number of different occasions, underdosing and overdosing. I don't know if we know what dosing is to underdose or overdose, <laughs> if that makes sense. So I don't think there is a, human beings again are so variable. So, you know, sometimes people are stressed. Sometimes people are tired. My dosing hopefully would reflect that, you know, so actually can we be guilty of overdosing? If I have a persisting pain patient who's had a long history of not exercising and not moving, I could easily overdose them and ruin their perception of exercise and, the, and, and how they feel about exercise because it leaves them lethargic. It leaves them sore. You know, it leaves them not being able to walk for three days because they've got terrible DOMS. So I understand what, what, what I understand the question in terms of underdosing that sometimes we can give really, really pissy little exercises to work the ubulus muscle or the, you know, that's off Anchorman, the ubulus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my favorite yeah, I... you know the scene you know the scene. <laughs> yeah um, i do no, yeah but we do <laughs> don't we? we um we can sometimes give exercise do you know what i don't want to talk about dosing do we under challenge people i think that's a better way to describe it because i could give someone an exercise that's not dose in terms of load but it's very challenging in terms of movement or does that make sense so actually for someone who has lower mm. back pain for someone who's got a lot of lower back pain, it might actually be harder for them to relax and move their trunk than it is for them to stiffen up and, and load themselves. It might be that they're loaded and stiffened already. So, so in that sense, you know, if I think of it, of, of challenges only as load, then that would be wrong because a challenge for them might actually be to relax. So I think rehab should be challenging, but there's a number of different ways in which we can challenge people. It's not just about load yeah lovely i think catherine liked that like you liked your comment there because she's just put up a comment while you were mid 
mid talking saying Ben for president. So I'd guess that she's reasonably. Um, <laughs> I mean, I tried. I mean, I'm going to go in 2020. I'm going to see. If I can um, I've got to be better than the other guy, right? I, I, fa I fancy your chances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, uh, I like to think we, you, you certainly myself and Craig are very, on very, very similar pages. Um, it's not much we disagree on. And, and I've always felt when I've listened to you, watched you, watched you lecture, read your posts that, that we're, 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 we're on incredibly similar pages, despite being from completely different backgrounds and, and, and treating people different parts of the body in different ways. Um, the, the general opinion that the, the human body is an incredibly robust and, and very capable or mostly capable uh, ecosystem, if that's the right word to use, which, which as we know, exhibits huge variation across our species. I know you're a big fan of the Nesta, of the Chris Nesta paper, because I remember sending yeah, it to you a couple of years back. Um, do you think there's anything, I mean, how much, how much interaction do you have with podiatrists on all your courses? I know we have a small percentage of probably, but uh, have you had much interaction with, with us over the years? And do you think there's anything, uh, and don't worry, you're not going to offend anyone by saying this, but do you think there's anything we, we're, we're lagging behind on that we really need to get up to speed with, with this whole, this whole topic? Well, certainly I think that I don't think it's a podiatry problem, but I think certainly healthcare in general needs to think more about the person that they're working with. Um, so it doesn't matter whether it's the foot, whether it's the knee, um, w whatever it is, you know, I, I think that's probably the, the main thing. Um, you know, so I, no, I've had podiatrists on my courses um, and I've enjoyed them immensely um, because, you know, they bring a totally different viewpoint. Um, often working in different ways and looking at different things. I mean, I've tried to read um, the subtalar e equilibrium theory paper a few times. If anyone's actually got to the end of it <laughs> and understood it, you are smarter than me. So I bow down before you. Uh, and that's Kevin Kirby, isn't it? I, I remember trying to read it, it for about daily for six months and it never really, I never got to the end. Um, <laughs> Um, but certainly I think that I don't think there's, you know, I, I think that podiatry probably is quite mechanical still. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, again, and I think the big mistake we all make is that we want to replace, we, it's perceived that we replace one thing with another. That if we're going to look at people and human beings and the psychology of pain and just pain in general, that we need to understand that it doesn't replace mechanics. It adds to it. It tries to explain what mechanics can't. And so it's just about really embracing it. I always say on my courses, it's a bit like a mechanic not understanding an engine is a therapist not understanding pain. Um, because it's out, what's the number one topic you work with? It's pain. So if you don't have a good grasp of pain or even a working grasp of pain, then that you need to improve that. But that doesn't just go for podiatrists. So I suspect their training into pain is less than whether you're a physio, an osteo, a chiro or whatever. Um, but still everyone else's wasn't great. My pain training came mostly learning about pain gate when I was electrotherapying, you know, the Jesus out of people. So um, for me, certainly if I was going to say, you know, I, 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 I think as all healthcare professions, we need to understand more about people and we need to understand more about pain and also the relationships with, with exercise as well. Unfortunately, I suspect there are three topics that podiatrists don't get exposed to very much. Yeah, just I've been on just on that. Yeah, that's therapy a pretty stuff. solid, pretty solid comment. Yeah, sorry, but just on that electrotherapy stuff, Ben. How, I mean, all the physiotherapists I interact with now are just not doing it. But how, how commonly is it still being used? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't. I'm not. Uh, I like. I don't work in a clinic with other people just because you know my life doesn't work for me that way anymore but um i i know that most people seem to have one you know you always see them in the corner of a room i'm not sure that many people turn them on mm. um yeah so I, I look i'm certain that there are lots of people who still use electrotherapy i can almost guarantee it um would i say your modern forward thinking clinician does probably less so yeah no. that sort of makes but sense still, you know, people are still just moving that head around gelling gelling people are moving the head it's happening <laughs> now somewhere in the world yeah <laughs> 
Um, Craig, anything, uh, anything pressing that came through the comments no, while the, we were uh, rambling on? The only, the only comment that came through, which was, um, I'm just scrolling back. Um, Catherine asked about how much of the psychology might be in the undergraduate program. And she was specifically sort of calling out Emma. And I've just tried to contact Emma to see if she was there, if she could come on for a minute and answer it. But it, it, it does refer back to that comment that you made before being about just how well a lot of these things are taught at the undergraduate program, both in physiotherapy and in with, within podiatry. You, know, you talked about the self-efficacy, the external, the internal local control. I mean, I'm familiar with that from my understanding of the diabetes literature and educating diabetes patients. Right. You know, but it's yeah. so not something that, that's necessarily specifically taught. I think uh, perhaps there is a psychology component maybe in the first year of a lot of allied health professional courses around the world, but it's not in the context of you know, treating someone in pain that you might be dealing with near the end of your training program. So I, I think there's huge gaps there in all, in all, all courses. And, you know, a lot of our understanding. Yeah, completely. Yeah. But a lot of all this understanding, it's only been a couple of years, in the last few years. I mean, I've only just become aware of it in the last perhaps two years. Um, so, I, you know, it's one thing to be critical of the, of the undergraduate programs. Well, you know, it, it'll, it'll get in there. Um, they've got to sit, same with electrotherapy. They've got to sit down, well, if we're going to put this in, what do we take out? You know, it's the electrotherapy. <laughs> well, that's, they yeah. could replace think, that directly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, I think there's a natural swap there. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, that's a point. Maybe in the physiotherapy undergraduate programs, they've got capacity for a lot of new content to go in to take out all the electrotherapy. But, um, and frictions. <laughs> Yeah. I think I was having this. I was having this chat with someone the other day, and I said, "So the problem, if you remove all that stuff from the undergrad, is twofold. Firstly, they go into clinical practice as a graduate, or even on a placement, and they're talking different languages, um, and that's obviously problematic. And secondly, um, we may have even mentioned it last week, Craig. We said, you know, those who those who aren't aware of history are doomed to repeat it." So if you remove it from, from the, the syllabus, if you don't teach it, I think teaching it in a historical manner is sensible because if you remove it and don't teach it, then in about 10 years, you'd have a load of physios going, well, I've just heard of this new thing called electrotherapy. And, and then you've got the whole same problem that just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> repeats it. <laughs> it's the fourth coming of Christ. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's just he's everywhere. He's non-stop. Um, Craig, we're, we've hit the hour. If we've not got any other questions, uh, should we wrap up? No, thanks also. No, so th thanks so much, Ben. That's been really, really good. Um, I'm sorry about this time lag. I'm at a conference in San Francisco, and there is quite a lag in the, in the time. So a little bit of talking over going on. So um, this video will be up sometimes the next day or two on YouTube and the podcast. I'm, as I said, I'm at a conference. So I may not be able to do it immediately. So you know, thanks again, Ben, and thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, mate. Pleasure. Thank you.